Okay, hi class. Welcome to your pre-recorded content for class on Friday, March 18th for all of my interior design friends. So if you weren't able to make it to class with us on Friday, after watching this video, you will have all the same content and hopefully be on track for next Friday. You might want to start and stop this video as you listen to it as we go through some of the different pieces that I covered in class today. And if at any point you're confused um, or you have other questions, please just reach out and we can definitely talk one-on-one -on -one and go over your booklet specifically, whatever you guys need, okay? All right, so this is gonna be slightly awkward, but I'm gonna um, show you some stuff on my webcam. I'm gonna share you some stuff on my screen. And we're gonna just see how this goes. All right, so here we go. So what we're specifically looking at on Canvas today is the grid lecture, which you can also download the PowerPoint that I'm going to share on screen if you want it just for your records for whatever reason. And then this in-class activity, creating an InDesign file for your booklet. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood how to set up their InDesign file. And so we'll go through that as well. There's nothing to turn in for either of those two things. I just stuck it on Canvas so that we all knew what we were doing in class. All right. And then this um, last item we will work on next week in class. So don't worry about that. Our primary focus for today is to start the insides of our project to booklets. And then for next Friday, we will hopefully have some version of the booklet and we will continue to refine it and work towards a finished booklet in the weeks to come. All right, so today's focus is on interior page design and that's really the focus for the entire week. All right, let's get started here. So we're gonna just start with a fairly short but interactive lecture on, um, I can't multitask, sorry. Okay, there we go. On interior page design. All right, I'm gonna make myself tiny and then I'll get bigger again as I need to show you stuff. Okay, so here we go. All right, so like I said, the focus of this week is on the inside of your booklets we're gonna start talking about the grid. Okay, so how to design and organize the insides, inside content. But first I have a quick interactive terms recap quiz, just to make sure we're all on the same page as far as terminology goes. Probably a lot of these terms you're gonna know, and if you don't know them, you'll learn them after this quiz. All right, so I gave this one on Friday morning at 9.30 as soon as everyone got back from break and daylight savings time. So it was a good like wake, wake them all up, pick me up kind of activity. Feel free to shout out the answers at home and, you know, have a little fun with it. All right, here we go. So this is a page. I just took a screen grab of page right off the like, in Illustrator or InDesign. So when we say a page, we're referring to a single-sided piece of paper. So one side of a sheet of paper is what a page is, okay? So if that was a page, what is this? Being what is a two pages put side by side, what is that called? That's right, it's called a spread. All right, so when we say spread, we're referring to two pages placed side by side. When we're specifically talking about pages in a printed book and there being a left-hand page and a right-hand page side by side, does anyone remember what that is called? There's also a little checkbox that you click on in InDesign when we're talking about this left and right hand pages. 
facing pages, right? So facing pages specifically refers to pages in a printed publication where there are right-hand pages and left-hand pages. And every printed publication, page one is a right-hand page and the last page is a left-hand page. It's just how it is, right? And so there is a little check check mark in InDesign that we check on to select facing pages. Otherwise, you could set up a document in InDesign that is in spreads, but it's just like spread, 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 spread down your pages panel in a row. That would not be facing pages. That would just be spreads. Facing pages is going to be one page, then one right hand page, then left and right, left and right, left and right, left and right, left. That's how you know you're in facing pages and that's what you need to create your booklet. Okay. So I took a screen grab of a page in InDesign. It looks like this when we're in normal mode. And we're just going to take a few minutes to just go over what all these various colored lines mean. Again, just so we all have the same terminology. So shout out the answers. Okay. What is this, the black line around the page? What is the black line? It's the trim line. So the trim line is your final document size. So if you set up a document to be eight and a half by 11, that black line is showing you eight and a half by 11, okay? So the final size of the document, the document size that you specify in InDesign is your trim size and it is that black line. Okay, what is the red line outside of the trim line? What would the red line be? It's the bleed, exactly. So the bleed is the like insurance you have when you have um, colored graphics, you know, colored pages, photography, illustration, anything that isn't white you want to set that artwork past the trim to a bleed line. That way, when you print it out and you cut it out, if you're not exactly precise, you don't end up with a sliver of white paper, but you end up with the rest of that artwork. So no one can tell that you didn't print it out exactly right. Okay. And the standard bleed is an eighth of an inch, which is 0.125. Okay. Next. All right, so these little blue ticky marks in the corners, those you wouldn't actually see in InDesign. I added those in. But if we now know what the trim line is and the bleed line is, what do you think those tick marks would be? You would see those if you printed out your final design. Right, those are your crop marks or your trim marks. So when you go to print out a poster or any kind of design out of Illustrator, Illustrator or InDesign, um, in the printing dialog box, you can turn on to print with crops and bleeds. So these are the crop marks. That way, when the artwork prints past the trim line, the crop marks are at the trim line so that you know where to cut to get down to the correct trim size. All right, so those are your guides for trimming down your final artwork when you print with bleed, which you all will do every single time from now on. Okay, good. All right, let's look at the inside of this page now. So now my arrow's pointing to that pink or purple outer rectangle. What is that line referring to? The margin, right. So the margin is both functional and aesthetic. It is the space between the edge of the page and where the body copy or the main bulk of information of your page sits. So the main text or part of your design fits within the margins. So you can have margins, you've got a top, a bottom, a left, and a right. Those can all be the same size, they can be different sizes, they can be whatever you want. It's completely your choice and it's going to change from design to design. 
The only real note I can give you about margins, which I'll probably mention again, is when you're working on print design, a quarter inch is really the minimum amount of margin you possibly could use. After that, it really looks like the text is just flying off the edge of a page. So when you're designing things that will be printed out, a margin is really crucial, um, it's a, lot, a lot less so in web design. All right, so those are margins and we will talk about those later in our lecture. All right. All right, so if those are the margins, what do you think these white spaces are that are running vertically within the margins and that other mystery vertical line that we will get to? What do you think that part of the document is? It's a column, right, a vertical block of area where the content is going to be positioned. So in this page, you can see I have two columns and I would run text from the left-hand margin to the edge of the first column and then I'd run more text from the edge of that column divider to the right-hand margin. If I didn't have that vertical break in the center, I would have a one column design and I would run text from left margin to right margin. All right, and again, your columns are both for readability, composition, and aesthetics. So you can have multiple columns, you can have one column, you can have irregularly width columns. It's, the choice is yours. And we will talk about columns again in a little bit in this lecture as well. And finally, I've sort of been referring to it, but I have not given it a name yet. What are these two vertical lines running down the center of my page? Hint, they refer to columns. It's the gutter. So the space between columns is called a gutter. And again, you can set the gutter width. It's an aesthetic and a readability issue. It can be kind of whatever you want, but the only real like rule of thumb is that the gutter should be smaller than the margins. Okay. Great job. How'd you guys do? Hopefully you did okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the grid. So the, a grid is your underlying structure when you're talking about a multi-page design. So like a magazine, catalog, a brochure, a website, a book, anything like that. Anything that has multiple pages is going to have some sort of grid established to help give your document unity, alignment, flow, and improve the readability. All right, so here is your definition. A grid is a guide. It's a compositional structure made up of both verticals and horizontals that divide a page into columns and margins. So let's look at how that happens. All right, so here I have um, a page from a magazine article and a website. So we use grids to organize all of our type and our images on our page. Um, if you have a ton of content in any sort of you know, newspaper or textbook or magazine, you want some kind of structure to help the reader understand where to find and read information, right? So you want to set up some kind of system where the reader knows, oh, all the headlines are going to be on the top left corner, and I'm going to start reading on the left, and there will be three columns of information, and I'll turn the page and do it all over again. Or, oh, if I want to figure out which section of the magazine I'm in, there will be a little, you know, colored bar at the top right, or there will be page numbers on the bottom corners. All of those bits of content are put in the same place on every single spread or most spreads to help give the document a sense of flow and organization. Additionally, you're always going to have what well, we've talked about before, like the same font styling for each design element, right? Think about your text hierarchy. We talked about that. That's going to remain consistent from page to page to page just as the whole alignment and underlining organization of the different elements is going to remain the same from page to page to page. It's going to help your reader know where to look for different information. 
And this counts for web as well. Same ballpark. All right, so now I'm kind of showing you what the underlying grid is of these two items. So you can see I've kind of like boxed out in pink the images and I've drawn in the cyan, the margins, and the columns. So if I'm looking at the print example, you can see, which you probably could tell by just looking at it, that there are three columns of information, right? And then when you start to draw rules around it, you can see that, oh, the image just about goes from column to column. Oh, that big black bar at the bottom, that goes from column to column, right? So it's spanning two full columns. So you can have stuff that's going to fit within one column. You can span elements across columns. The grid is really just your guide. So then you can design around this guide to have a bit of organization even amongst the differences. Same thing with a website, right? So there's three columns and within each column there's an image, then there's some text, then there's an image, then there's some text. So it has a bit of rhythm to it, but none of the pictures are any wider or narrower than the full column width. So that helps give it a sense of org organization. All right, I'll flip back and forth one more time. Okay. Okay, so think of your grid as really like your skeletal structure. It's all about continuity and unity and visual flow. Here is another spread. So a spread means two pages next to each other, right? Very good. All right, so because it's a spread, that is why there's a really big gap in the center of it so that those interior margins are extra wide because it's a magazine, right? You think about like the creep of the spine. Okay, so just know that's what you're looking at. All right, so looking at this spread, we talk about the grid um, per page. So you can use both pages to help you figure out the answer to this question, but how many columns is the grid structure for this magazine? Okay, well the correct answer was four. Did you guess four? And you can sort of see it now that I have drawn out again the margins and columns and boxed out the images. So I'm, I believe there are four columns because if I look at the text on the interior columns and then I multiply out that width out, I can divide that page from within the margins into four equidistant columns, right? So again, you can see there was a lot of variety on this spread. Some images are spanning all four columns. The headline spans all four columns, and so does the subhead. Then we have images going two columns wide, text running two columns. We even have that one image on the bottom right spanning three columns wide with the text kind of like popping into it because they just needed a little bit more space, right? So you can sort of see how there's a lot of elements in this spread, but the designer is using the grid to help them understand where the content should basically be placed to help keep it feeling professional and clean. We want nice alignment, right? So like the edges of the images and the text are all perfectly aligned and it's very easy to read even amongst all these pictures and various textiles and everything else. All right, so this is our mid-lecture quick exercise. I'll make myself big again. Okay, hi. So you're going to need to pause it here and go find a few supplies. You're gonna need any kind of magazine or some multi-page something, preferably. You're gonna need a piece of tracing paper or some kind of thin paper, or if you don't mind drawing in your print collateral, you can just draw right in here and you don't need this. 
You're also going to want a ruler or some kind of straight edge and a pen or a pencil. Okay, so go find those things and come back. Okay, so what we're doing is step one, flip through your magazine or whatever and find an article of your choice that has some type of information, most likely in columns. What you're looking for is an article. What you're not looking for is an ad, okay? So ads, pe companies buy the actual page or spaces on the page and they do whatever they want in that space. So it's going to have a completely different alignment and organization than the actual magazine itself. So we're looking at the actual magazine design, not the print ads. Okay, so this is my magazine article I'm going to work with. And what I'm gonna have everybody do is spend a few minutes and try to draw out the margins and columns just like I was doing in my PowerPoint. So see if you can figure out where the margins are, how many columns are in this, where the gutters are, and start to understand how the images and text have been aligned within that grid. So one helpful hint will be, if you have a magazine article that's multiple pages long, look at all the pages within that article. So magazines might employ various grids for the same magazine, but within one article, they'll definitely all be the same. So here's another, oh, here's another page of this same article and you can see how it looks kind of different, but I have a feeling if I draw the grid and then put it on top of this grid, it will match or be the mirror image of. And then this, mag this article has a third page there. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes to trace out some grids and then we will see how we do. I'm going to do it with you so you don't have to pause me yet. So again, you're looking for the margins that would be the top, bottom, left, and right edges of the content and images. You're looking for columns of, again, images or content and the space between the columns, which are the gutter. So in something like my example where there was an image on top and text down below, the columns and gutters are still going to run from top margin to bottom margin every single time. So make sure you draw your lines from top margin to bottom margin. Think about how when you set up a document in InDesign, that is exactly how it looks if you've ever set something up with columns before. If you want to draw out where the images are, you can. You put an X across the edges of the image. Otherwise, just draw the margins and the columns. So here is my finished trace. Let's see if I can show this to you in a way in which we can all see it. All right, so there you can kind of see how I've traced out where the text is. And then you, this is so awkward. All right, and then it's hard to tell on the tracing paper overlay, but there was this little third or um, fourth column that was like, where is my finger? Really, really skinny on the end here. That's more of like caption information. So I would call this grid a three column with a really wide, with a little sidebar over here. So it's not like a true fourth column because it's not including the body text. Um, and then if I flip the page and I flip my trace, 
it will line up with the tiny little sidebar column being on the other side of the page. So it's basically the mirror image. Okay, so you might notice that as well, especially if you found an article that's a spread. There will be some sort of perhaps mirror image for the symmetry of the full spread. But if you flipped your tracing paper, you would notice that it would all actually magically line up again. All right, so hopefully you guys did that. Hopefully a little deconstruction always helps reveal how a designer puts something together. Feel free to pause me and scope out other pages of your magazine and see if that same grid that you trace could be applied to multiple articles. It probably can. All right, I'll make myself tiny and let's get back to the lecture. Okay. And we're back. Okay, so we just traced out the margins and as I was kind of saying while we were rambling and talking while we did our exercise, the margins really are the container for all of your design. So all of your design includes text, images, graphics, illustrations, everything, right? Different types of text. It's all going to fit within these margins. The margins are really containing the artwork to the page, especially when you start printing stuff out. The margin really helps give the viewer focus and it gives your content a bit of breathing room between before it hits the edge of the page and just falls into the, you know, whatever's around it environment. When we're running text or most elements, we are running them within the margins. Of course, with everything, you're always going to break the rule and pull stuff past the margin when needed for aesthetic purposes, right? Like it's super common to run photography to the edges of the page, not super common to run text to the edge of the page, again, unless it was like a very like graphic stylized choice, but we very often will run photography and different visuals to the edge of the page and then passed with our bleeds. You'll also start to notice if you pull your ruler out and start flipping through magazines is that we also oftentimes will set content outside the margin. Things like page numbers, any kind of running headers or footers are often set outside the margin because that is sort of like periphery information. It's not the main content. The main content lives inside the margins, okay? Which is often why you'll see different margin widths on the top or the bottom or left or right to account for things like you saw my GQ magazine, that little sidebar of captions or, you know, a footer information, page numbers, chapter names, that kind of stuff. That's all going to be outside the margins. Okay. You might be asking yourself at this point, how many columns should my grid have? How do I even know? So there is really no rule around this. It's, um, again, your choice. It's an aesthetic choice. It's also a readability choice, of course. Some like loose suggestions I can make would be when you're working with content that's more of a narrative or um, a single idea, you're probably going to want to run that in a one column as long as the line lanes don't get too long. If the line lanes are getting too long and you have to move your head to read the information, you'll put it in two columns. But think about things like fiction books or essays. Um, that kind of stuff is most often seen as a one column design so that it's very easy and comfortable to just sort of read through it from front to back. You could employ a two column design if you have, you know, a couple elements, maybe you have a few images or a quote or something, um, or your page size is just larger 
where it would be uncomfortable to read a one column design. Those are some different reasons why you might want to go to a two column grid. And then thirdly, if you could run a three column or more grid when you have multiple types of information. Think about like magazine articles or reports, things where you're going to have body text and images and captions and maybe like sidebar content or pull quotes or different types of elements that are all going to have to work their way into this design. The more columns you have, you actually have more flexibility because you have more chances to create different elements that are various widths when they span multiple columns, but there's still that sense of structure underneath. Okay, so again, the choice is yours and we will talk about potential grid ideas for your booklet when we get to that part of today. But keep that in mind. All right, and one other thing that I've sort of been talking around but I thought I should say is very often within one larger piece, think like magazine, book, catalog, website, you could have various grid structures at play. So you might have noticed if you flip through a magazine that most articles adhere to your one maybe grid system, but a couple other ones didn't. They were totally different. And so within different types of information, you might have various grids, as well as you might have a different grid within one article design, like in this example. So the first page of my article has a different grid system than the rest of the article. So when I got, get into the content of the article, it's this four column grid, and you can see how there are ads and a gray box of resources and photography, and it's all very much fit within these four columns. But the front page of the article is running three columns with a very large, with a very wide left-hand margin. And it just gives it a chance to have a really big headline and make that front page stand out as the beginning of the story. And even if I can find my GQ article, it did the exact same idea. So this was the page that I <coughs> traced the grid on, but actually if I go forward one page, this is the actual beginning of my article, and you can see it looks totally different, right? But it looks like the beginning of a story. It makes you stop and read it and realize like, oh, something new is about to happen in this magazine. That would be a grid variation when we're dealing with multiple items that are multiple pages long and we want to make sure the reader really understands it like, hey, something new. This is the beginning. Okay, so that is where grid variation could come into play. So if you would like to flip back through your magazine, maybe you'll find that. All right, well, we're gonna move on, keep things moving here. We got stuff to design. Okay, oh, maybe make myself smaller again. <clears throat> All right, so you basically have three grid options. You've got kind of make it up yourself, whatever you want it to be, custom grid, which is what we've been looking at and what we've been deconstructing and most likely what you're going to make. Uh, but there are also two other types of grids that you could for sure try out and see if you can get to work for your design. One of them being the baseline grid. So baseline grid, think about a notebook that has lines, you know, those blue lines in a notebook. Every horizontal blue line would be a piece of your grid and you would set you would set the space between blue lines and you would set your type to a certain point size and letting and 
that would magically make, just like as if you were writing in this notebook, lines of text fall on the baseline of each of these horizontal blue lines. That also means that you can only set certain types of letting per two point sizes to maintain that ratio because InDesign is going to force the line, the spaces, the letting between lines of text to fall on those baselines. This is a very restrictive way of designing, in my opinion, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, but this is an example of a couple spreads that employ a bit of a baseline grid to them. And you can see how from spread to spread, all the information is really starting and stopping on the same horizontal planes. Okay. That would be a baseline grid. Another type of grid is a modular grid. So similar to a baseline grid, but this time instead of just horizontals, we've also introduced these verticals in specific dimensions. So it's sort of like columns vertically and then like columns horizontally where you've created these divisions within your page and you use those divisions to basically fill in all the squares with different bits, whether it's content or images, everything is falling within those blocks, like in this example. I think a modular grid is really what we think about in web design, <clears throat> where this would be a nine block modular grid and you can see all the different ways you could use that grid to create different layouts. And if you kind of think about those dark gray squares as being images and the light gray squares as being text, you could sort of envision a lot of these pages as things you've seen before, probably especially on like websites, right? Where like the first one would be like a grid of portfolio images and the one below would be like a top banner of image and like three columns of text. Right? So you can kind of see how this modular grid could play out over multiple pages, whether print or digital. And there is a bunch of flexibility within it, but it's also at the same time very regimented. Okay. So now forget all of that constriction. And let's just talk about creativity within the grid. So for sure, you're going to establish some type of underlying grid structure, whether you just do it organically or you try to do one of these more precise grid techniques. At the same time, we should always look for opportunities to break the grid, to do something a little more fun and whimsical if it is appropriate for your design. So here's just a couple examples of more creative grids um, that you could consider. All right, so here's obviously it says clowns and the designer used the width of the letter forms to create these spaces to put the text into, which is super fun. Here's uh, the red one has like this big diagonal in it and you can see some of the text is actually like set to that diagonal shape. But at the same time, there is clearly a two column structure happening here. When you look at the right hand page, the information on the top and the bottom has the, is the same width. You can see that center gutter edge very, very clearly. So again, there is definitely an underlying grid at play, but at the same time, this is a very creative and fluid design. So they can for sure work together. And then leaks. I think that is very nice, very organized content, but then the photograph is sort of like breaking the grid and it's, you know, spilling out to the right and to the left of that center column with the brackets. And then this is a um, brochure that I think does a really nice job of using most likely a modular grid, um, but I feel like each spread still feels intentional and different than the last. But if you look really hard, you'll notice that it's two column 
and then there's like a wide sidebar on the outer edges of the spreads. So like on towering achievement, they're using that side as for the illustration. The right hand page, they've got one photograph bleeding to the edge of that sidebar and then they have like a tiny inset picture and some caption copy over there. The next spread down with Long Island's new Atlantic Avenue, there's a photo. And then on the other side, there's like a quote or something. So they're doing something different with that little extra side on the edges in each spread to make it feel fresh. But it's also, again, super organized when you stop and really look at how it's been laid out and envision the grid underneath that they set in InDesign. And then sometimes you might be designing something where there needs to be a moment where you don't want a grid, where you're going to align to the page or to visual elements with on the page. You're just doing something more expressive and that is cool too. Okay, so here are two examples where the one on the left where it says breaking the grid, there is clearly a grid at play. It's a weird grid where the text starts on the right and then you kind of read it to the left and then lash blast there really isn't a grid they've aligned the text to the various mascaras on the spread so you can definitely be creative and do something a little crazier again if it matches the aesthetic of your book um, and have a little fun with it okay we're almost there guys like two more slides Okay, so now you might be wondering, okay, I kind of get it, but how in the world am I supposed to do this? There is a visual shorthand that we use as designers to help us sketch what the grid should be in our books. So that is what I'm showing you here. So how we do it is if you want to denote an image, you draw the shape of the image. Usually it's a rectangle of some kind. And then you put an X through it from you know the top to the bottom. If you think back to InDesign, the tool you use to draw image boxes looks just like that. So that is where that symbol came from in InDesign. It's just the visual shorthand we use. If you want to talk about body text, that is on the right hand image those rectangles with the little squiggles in them. So the rectangle is talking about the column size and the squiggle means text. You could also do it like on the left in the purple where there's just horizontal lines and those indicate lines of text and the space between the horizontal lines is talking about the type of letting you might employ and the width of the horizontal lines would be the the line length of the text. Okay, so if you like it more boxed or less boxed, those are kind of your choices. If you have something like a headline, you would draw a rectangle. Uh, you can see that on the purple sketches on like page five and page six and seven. You see it's just some long rectangles. Again, the height of the rectangle would be the height of the capital letters. The width of the rectangle would be the width of, you know, about the width of the headline. So are you thinking about a short headline or do you have like a huge headline you have to account for? You're kind of just sketching that in. You might also just write certain words that you know are going to be like humongous, like I wrote Bolivia. Um, or like a W for a job cap. You might have like large pull quotes and you might draw out the quotation marks like they did like on the right hand sketch. When like the first column on the bottom, you see like a square with some squiggles and quotes around it. That means like large pull quote. Most often, you're also sketching in a spread, right? because it's really important that as you design spread, you design these pages that you think about them, how they're going to look printed, which means they're going to be next to each other as spreads. So design in spreads when at all possible. Okay. All right. So my last tip for sketching out a grid is to actually sketch to your content. So it's really important to know what this book is supposed to say 
do you have images? How many images? What type of images? Do you have graphics? Do you have icons? Do you have, you know, quotes? Do you have captions? How long is the body copy? How long are the headlines? Are there subheadlines? All of those questions of like, what is the content? You should know. You might even have it up on your screen as you're sketching. And then you should be sketching these pages to account for all of that information. You might not know exactly which pictures are going to go in each spread, but you might, but, or you might, right? Or you might be like, listen, I know I'm going to want like one hero image. And then I have, you know, about three columns of information with a headline and I'm going to have a photo caption. So make sure when you sketch that out, that spread, you have all of those elements accounted for. That way you can use that sketch as like a blueprint and put it into the computer. Okay. My final slide, if I haven't like hit it home enough, the benefits of using a grid. Think about it like no grid is like the top image. It's just a bunch of people swimming around in the ocean, willy nilly, all crazy. Using a grid is like swimming in lanes in a pool, right? There's alignments, there's definite boundaries that keeps the content in order. There's a structure to it, there's a clarity, there's a unity, there's visual flow and consistency. And that is what we are after, okay? All right, great job. Take a minute, internalize all of that. Feel free to pause me. Um, and then we will come back and talk about the order with which you should do things for this project and then we will talk about um, starting an InDesign document. All right. Okay, we're back. Part two, I hit the wrong button, so this is probably a new video. Okay, so now that we've learned what the grid is and kind of started looking at how the grid is used on multi-page designs, it is time to now think about how we can employ the same gridded techniques into our own Project 2 booklets. All right, so I'm too big, a little smaller. All right, look at the calendar. Okay, I'm going to be honest, I'm in my Monday, Wednesday class because it's more organized. <laughs> but <laughs> the same premise applies. Okay. We are here. We are trying to make it to this interior comp one with revised covers for end of class next Friday. Because we only meet once a week, I don't really expect everyone to have a full 12 page book created, but I'm optimistic. Maybe you'll all get much further than I think you will. Um, we're also going to do this text hierarchy exploration in class on Friday, which will directly affect your design. Then when we make it into April, there will be another comp of your book the following Friday, which will have all the pages in it, and it should be fairly tight. Um, and then we will have a final version of the book, most likely due on the 8th, the very, very latest, the 15th, because we have one more thing to do and class is over this day. All right, so we're getting we're running out of week, so we're gonna get it done. Okay, so I'm looking for you guys to Revise your cover designs as needed, which will be a whole separate conversation I'll have with you via email, um, and to start the interiors of the book. Okay, so there are a few steps that you need to take. Everybody's probably at a different point right now, so that's why I wrote it all down. Feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, we're committed to memory. All right, so to-do list. Step one. If you haven't completed your content, you need to do that ASAP. What that means is 
there was an assignment weeks ago where you had to like find content, but you actually need to decide what information you want to include in your book. Make sure you have headlines and subheadlines and captions and quotes and any other content you want to include has to be in one place, in one document, figure out what you want to say. Okay, that's step one. If you've done that, step two is to map that content to the document. So again, it's a 12 page book. Four of those pages are the cover, right? Here's my paper dummy. So it's a 12 page book. That means you're gonna get, you have three pieces of paper stacked on top of each other, folded in half. That's 12 pages. Page one is the cover. Page two is the inside cover. Page 11 is the back inside cover. And page 12 is the back cover, leaving you eight pages of information that you need to design. So when I say map the content to the document, I literally mean sketch out a 12 page book like you see on the screen and write next to each page what information is going there. Okay, that way you can one, make sure you have enough information to fill up all the pages and two, make sure that the flow of information is good, that you have enough information and not too much information for each of your spreads. You could draw it like you see on the screen and just write little notes next to each box or within each page box. Or if it's easier for you to visualize, you can create a tiny little paper dummy like this. And again, write in the spreads exactly what's going to be on the spread. So like the title of the spread would be the downfall. I've got four paragraphs, three photos, and a graphic element that I need to account for. Right, and I know that, uh, I know that because I created a Word doc of all of my content already, and now I'm just mapping the content to the individual pages within my book. Okay, so like steps one and step two are not Canvas assignments, but they are critical to moving on to step three, which is your next Canvas assignment, step 12 of the project two module. Step 12 has two parts within the same assignment. Because you're doing this, and I can't see you, um, submit as many things as you think are reasonable and you'd like me to look at and react to for step 12. So that means take some screenshots of your paper sketches and then if you want to take screenshots of every page of your paper dummy, awesome. If you just want to take a picture of a paper dummy being like, look, I made it, that's fine too. Okay. All right. So step 12 in Canvas is asking you to do two things. The first thing it's asking you to do is to sketch out three options for your interior design of your book. So that's going to look like let me just pull up Canvas here and we just look at it together. All right. Uh, this. <laughs> Is it that? Project two, step 12. Okay, this is what you're going to work on next. Okay, sketching. Here is an example of what the sketching will look like. Oh, there you go. That's the same picture. All right, so again, you're going to sketch out. You kind of already designed the cover, so you could sketch that in real quick, or you could just leave a blank. I'm really just talking about those eight interior pages that I want you to think about now. You're going to sketch out all eight pages, it's like three and a half spreads, four spreads, and you're gonna sketch those out with your actual content in mind. So since you mapped out the content and you know you have a headline, four paragraphs, three pictures, and a quote 
to go on page 6-7, you're going to sketch out all those elements on page 6-7. At the same time, you're starting to think about your grid. Do you want this to be in two columns, in three columns, in one column? What is the design of the interior going to be? So you're doing a lot of things within these sketches, uh, and I'm asking you to do three options. So that means all 12 pages, three times, three different ways. Maybe you have different grid systems. Maybe you have, you know, different visual elements, different places. Three different ideas that are all supporting your adjectives and primary aesthetic. So keep those adjectives and the overall aesthetic of your book and your cover design in your mind or up on your screen as you're doing this because obviously the inside should relate to the outside. Okay, I know it's a lot of things to think about, right? Okay, let's go back here. Okay, and again, cover, inside front cover is just a photograph, color wash, a graphic, it's not text. So this is just visual information. Your first page of content is page three. This will most likely be some sort of introduction or overview page, single page. Then you're designing one, two, three, four, more pages in the, oh, ooh, bad job me, I have two pieces of paper, let's start over, that was too many things, all right, cover, <sighs> sorry guys, all right, so page one, single page, there we go, page one, spread, two spread, three spread, this is either single page, inside back cover, again, color wash, photograph, no information, or if you need it, it can be fourth spread and you can run the information all the way onto the back cover. Either way is fine and not weird. Then back cover, okay? So you're really designing three to four spreads and a page. Okay, so it's not that long of a book. Keep that in mind as you're designing and as you're deciding what content to put in this book. It's your own content. You can It can be about whatever about your architect that you want it to be, okay? So it could have a ton of information, light on information, any kind of information that's generally relevant to your person, which we have talked about. So just keep that in mind as you go, make sure you know, it all is going to fit and you like how it looks because you are also the author so you can edit down as needed. Okay. So that's sketching. You're going to sketch us three choices here. Then, of those three choices, you're going to pick your favorite. It's probably not going to be a hard choice. You're probably going to have a favorite right off the bat. And that's when you're making your paper dummy. Let's see which is what I keep holding up, right? Okay, so I personally would probably find some paper and trim it out to be 14 by nine so that my dummy was to size, to size being seven by nine. If you prefer to design a horizontally aligned book, you can design it where it's nine by seven it's up to you. This is the stage with which you will choose which way you want to go. If you've designed your covers and you're like, my cover kind of works better if it was more horizontal than vertical, now is the time to make that decision and switch it up. Um, but the choice is yours. So it's either going to be 7 by 9 or 9 by 7 trimmed out. Okay. 
You know my paper dummy's all whacked out. Well, that's a bummer. Okay. Okay, I think this will work. <laughs> this will work for now. Okay. All right. So once you've cut out your paper dummy or a bunch of papers, again, it's three pieces of paper folded in half, stuck together. That is the length of your book. That is 12 pages. That is what we're making. Then you're going to take your favorite sketch from part one there and translate it onto this piece of paper. Why am I having you do this? For two reasons. One, so that you can make sure, again, that you've accounted for all of your content and that you like the way it looks and that it fits good. You can bust out a ruler and do it a little bit more precisely than you did the sketches. And two, because again, we're making a printed book and there's really no way to get a sense of flow from spread to spread unless you create a book and flip pages from spread to spread. And so truly that is what you're checking to make sure you like how it feels from spread to spread. Because again, you want a little variety within your grid, but you're looking for an overall consistency that makes your book feel organized and unified. Okay? Take some kind of image of this paper dummy so I know that you did it when you submit your assignment. Okay, so that is step 12. That is what I'm looking for everyone to accomplish by the end of class on Friday. That's steps three and four. Then you're ready to start designing your book in InDesign. That is the next step. That is what we're aiming towards to hopefully start today. You might not get to it today because you might have been still working on your content but it's what we're going to aim to do this week. So when we meet back up again in person next Friday, everyone has an InDesign document of 12 pages and with most of the pages hopefully filled in. So I wanna just open InDesign and go through how to set up that document so that we're all on the same page. So let's do that now. Okay, so here is InDesign. I'm gonna make myself tiny. I don't think you need to see my face for the moment. All right, new file. All right, so we've already talked about it. We're making a book. It's either seven by nine or nine by seven. Seven by nine is a horizontal page. Nine by seven is a vertical page. Nine by seven is a horizontal page. Look at the little people pictures. All right. It's 12 pages, so type 12 in here. And here is where that whole facing pages thing was. If you remember way back, the beginning of when I started rambling, you want to make sure this is clicked on. That is for facing pages so that we have a right-hand page, then lefts and rights down to a left-hand page. You can start setting your columns and your gutters right here on this front page if you want, if you have some idea of what you're looking for, as well as your margins. We can also go back and change them after the fact as well. More than often, I'll set them here and just change them once I start designing and figure out what I actually am making. The link here, right now it's linked off so I can change each margin independently. If I turn the link on, they'll all be the same. And you can use up, down arrows, or you can type in the box, just like every other box in InDesign. If I keep scrolling down, you'll see bleed. We talked about bleed. So we're gonna want bleed because our books are gonna print. The industry standard for bleed is an eighth of an inch, which is 0.125. So I'll type that in there. We don't need to worry about slug, so we'll ignore that and we are ready to hit create. Most important things were the width, the height, the units, facing pages is on 12 pages. 
bleed. All right, great. If I open the pages panel, I can see that I have facing pages because again, page one is a right-hand page, page 12 is a left-hand page. All the pages in between are spreads. That's what we're looking for. Okay, if you go to Canvas, and you go back to the module, to the project unit. All right, so the overview, we'll open that, but then the overview was giving you the flat size and the trim size for reference. It also has some good hints about body copy size and you know things to consider for your text, your imagery, and your color. So as you start to really dig into this, you might want to reread the overview assignment just since it's been a couple weeks. But more importantly, the thing that we're looking at today is this column type system for your booklet. So this is the suggested template as a starting point. So that's kind of what we're gonna make today. You can thousand percent deviate from this, but if you're feeling really baffled, you might want to stick with something simpler, and this would be a good simple option. Now, I know this is written a little weird, so I'm going to show you how to do like designer math to understand what it's saying. I'll make myself a little bit bigger here. Okay, so it's suggesting a two or three column grid for your book. Um, it's saying that your columns should be somewhere between two and three inches wide. The gutter space between your columns should be a quarter of an inch. And then of course our bleed is an eighth of an inch, which we've already talked about. So this is a screenshot of an InDesign page if you were gonna make a horizontal book where it's nine by seven. So this is a three column grid with a half inch margin and quarter inch gutters. And that's what that looks like. How you do math, how you do math. All right, hold on, let me get some paper out here. All right, so I wonder if there's, I can just do it here. Let's see. Draw. Okay, I'm going to try to draw it on the screen. All right, so if I know I have, yeah, that's good, draw. Okay, I know I have a page. So if I'm going to do a vertical book, so I think a lot of you are doing vertical books at this point because in my head it was always a vertical book. All right, so the page is 7 by 9. All right, so then you figure you're going to have a margin of, like a half inch, that's like a good standard generic margin. So that's 0.5. If you put a two column grid in there, the gutter is 0.25. So if I want to know how wide my column widths are, I would take the seven minus the right and left hand margins. So that's, they're both half an inch. So that would be minus an inch minus the gutter leaves me with, I'm running out of room here, 5.75, right? You with me so far? Total width of the page minus the two margins minus the gutter equals 5.75 is the total width I have for both columns. So then I have two columns, so I would divide that by two Thank you, calculator. So 5.75 divided by two. So my columns are almost three inches, 2.875, that's like two and seven eighths wide. So each of those are two and seven eighths wide. So that's good. That's with totally within the recommended range. And you could kind of do a little more funky math if you're trying to figure out what your column width would be. Probably the easier way to do it is just to open up InDesign and start 
making text boxes and figuring out the WIS. Um, but that's how you would do designer math. Okay. Anyway, here we go. So that is essentially what this is. And I can prove my awesome math skills if I make myself small and out of the way. Well, yeah, real small. Bye. <laughs> All right, so if I draw a text box here from margin to gutter, you can see right here the width is 2.875. I did the math correctly. Right, so basically you're looking for about this width or something in this vicinity for your columns of information, right? You don't want anything too narrow or you don't get enough words per line. You don't want anything too wide because then it kind of gets hard to read and you don't have enough room for variety within your grid. Uh, but you can definitely make whatever you want. All right, so let's just go over. So this is basically, this is your basic InDesign file. You could set this up half inch margins, quarter inch gutter, two columns, and design within this framework and be perfectly successful. If you want to, you start designing and you realize that, oh, I kind of want my margin to be kind of different or you want to change some stuff up, totally go for it. I'm going to just give you a couple quick tips in InDesign on how to make those things happen. But if you do run into any questions, please ask me. All right, so if you want to change the margins or the columns globally for your whole booklet, you're going to want to come up here to the parent page, formerly known as the master page. So if I double click up here, you can see a parent is now selected and I'm now looking at the parent page. So if I highlight both pages on the pages panel by holding down shift to get the second page, I can now go up under our layout, margins and columns, and I can change the margins and columns. So again, this would make it, um, I can do each one independently. If I turn the link on, they're all gonna work together. So let's say I want a little bit more top and a little bit less bottom. And oops, I did not mean to click that because now they're all the same again. <sighs> you can also just type in the boxes. I was going to make the outsides a little narrow, a little wider than the insides. So I just did that backwards. You can kind of see how it looks. It's changing as I change things. Right? Okay. And maybe I want like two columns and then like a sidebar. So I could do that by either setting up a three column grid. I'm going to show it to you both ways. Or I can set it up by having a two column grid and a really large side margin. It's up to you how you want to do it. All right. So this would just be a standard three column grid. If I want one column to be narrower than the other two, this is how I would do it. Go up under view, guides and grids, and you're going to unlock the column guide. Say it's like default locked on. So if I click it, I can now move these columns, like clicking and dragging. Fancy, right? All right, so maybe I want like a small column like that. If I want to make the pages mirror images of each other, I'm just going to draw a box and do this and then line this up. That way I don't have to do math. And then if I want these two columns to be equidistant instead of just eyeballing it, I think the easiest way to do it is to draw a text box from the whole width and then set this to two columns. Set the gutter to whatever to match this gutter. And then you can see where I should align this to magically match up like so. And I'll move it over here and I'll do this. There, and delete that. All right, so now I have like a little sidebar and two columns. So that's kind of cool. And once you're done futzing around with the columns, definitely go back 
and lock them back down so you don't mess those up later. All right, so now if I go to any spread, they're all the same. Cool, right? All right, so the other way you can do it if you're trying to create a more irregular design is, let's go back under view. Okay. So now it says custom because they're not the same distance anymore. Okay. Let's make my outside columns like wider. You could do it like this and then just draw a guide. And that way you have like this space for your sidebar information and then this is like your new margin for your extra information. Again, to not do math, I would totally just draw a box and then I'll see I was off. There you go. So you could do something like that as well. Also when you're pulling guides, right, you click and drag from the ruler. If you want to have a guide go across the whole spread, when you click and drag, put your mouse out past the edge of the page and now all of a sudden it will do the guide for the whole spread. So on the page, it's just the page. Outside the page is for the whole spread. So that is a handy tip as well. And then you could draw guides up on the parent like so, or you can draw individual guides on your pages when you're trying to align stuff. All right, I think those were my pro tips for InDesign. Be, for, be sure to save this file if you plan on using it. Otherwise, when you go to create a new file next time, make sure your pages panel looks like this because you have faces pa facing pages on and you have a total of 12 pages. Okay. I think that's all I have to say, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. I know this was a little long. Good luck. Pull up our... Um, to do's one last time. So for sure, work through steps one through five, and then we are working towards that step 12 first draft of the full book for end of class next Friday. If you need anything between now and next Friday, please send me an email. We can chat on Zoom um, or through email, whatever's easiest, depending on your questions. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys again in the classroom. Bye.